Pleased to be here with Poverty Free Ontario. Uh, and as you know, since you have local groups here in the region, both local one in Kitchener and the Waterloo Region one, we've been active in more than 25 communities around the province uh, with local groups to support uh, essentially three, three uh, main uh, objectives in our fight to be, be eradicate poverty. To end deep poverty, make sure people on social assistance is the first step. No one lives uh, at only 80% of the poverty uh, line in, in the province. Uh, secondly, uh, we end working poverty. We make sure people who are working at the low end of the labor market uh, earn a minimum wage that gets them out of poverty. And we have a formula that recommends 10% of the level. And we protect food money as necessary in terms of making sure housing and food costs are, are, uh, are accommodated for what people need. And when we look at the uh, commissioner's report, and we had a lot of it, tried to have a lot of input into it. We of course agree, uh, as most of you do, and are happy that they're recommending a hundred dollars a month uh, increase uh, in a, what they call the standard rate for single uh, people. Uh, and they recognize the inadequacy that exists. Unfortunately, uh, they uh, they also uh, are paying for that, or proposed paying for that by uh, cutting a good chunk of the special diet allowance and the disability workers benefit. Uh, and uh, they only recommend 86 percent increase, uh, essentially eight six dollars as opposed to hundred dollars for people who are living together. Which might see that see that people who live together and are in social assistance do share costs. But when you're talking to people at that low end of the uh, uh, income uh, side of things, uh, fourteen dollars makes a big difference. You know, when they essentially have their daily uh, expenses uh, based on the current rate or even the increased rate is about $23. So $14 a day uh, uh, for a month is a, is a significant difference. Um, I recommend, uh, we focus locally on the adequacy issue in Poverty Free Ontario. And the commissioners recommend a standard rate uh, uh, be established for all people in social assistance with uh, what they call building blocks, additional benefits that will help them improve their income situation and also be available when it's fully transformed the system, not just for people on social assistance, but working poor people as well. So they have what they consider to be a standard rate, what they call a basic measure of adequacy, and we want to point out some of the problems with that to begin with. Uh, first of all, uh, one of our real concerns is the, uh, the commissioners no longer want to use the official poverty income measure, uh, the low income measure, the low income measure, uh, as uh, the, po the official poverty line of the province. That uh, is that everybody uh, should be at least at 50 percent of the uh, median income uh, to uh, be able to uh, be able to be considered uh, out of poverty. Uh, that's a serious problem. Essentially, they're reestablishing what it means in terms of uh, in terms of uh, measuring progress as your distance from the labor market as opposed to your distance from the poverty line. And we think that's uh, a backward step. We fought hard in uh, when the uh, poverty reduction strategy was. Uh, was being developed uh, through the 25 to 5 network. To one of our wins was to establish uh, the low income measure used internationally as a basic measure of uh, income poverty, as the measure that should be used to determine you know, who is in poverty and who is out of poverty and how we mark, chart our progress, which in the UK they've used quite effectively to chart uh, progress over time. So we think uh, actually uh, kind of getting rid of the low income measure as our basic measure of uh, official poverty line is, or ignoring it. Is really not uh, is really a backward step. Our next problem is that they talk about setting a new standard rate, what they call a basic measure of adequacy, which when you actually look at it, the research that it's based on, it is really not so much. It is not a basic measure of adequacy. It is really a basic measure of subsistence. You know what uh, people need minimally uh, to try to uh, get through the month. And uh, essentially, the, one of the reasons for doing this is what they call the fairness test and the disincentive to work test. The uh, kind of the um, canard essentially that people uh, if they earn too much in social assistance they're not going to want to work which hasn't been demonstrated in any practical or empirical way it's more an ideological position than actual evidence-based position in terms of what the social assistance rate should be uh, we don't think that essentially a fairness test is based on distinguishing between the needs of people on social assistance and the needs of people who are working for people uh, a kind of divisive measure like that is helpful we think the true measure of, uh, of fairness should be uh, how much, you know, are these both populations being assisted to actually be part of society, part of the community, uh, being included in terms of work and other contributions and gifts that they have to offer, as opposed to being kind of pitted against each other in terms of what's adequate to provide for each. If we had a labor market that actually provided a decent minimum wage that got people out of poverty and was moving towards living wages that help people who essentially establish the kind of uh, uh, incomes that they could earn to be more deeply entrenched into the mainstream of society, that that would be uh, essentially the more the, the fairer test of, uh, 
of what um, you know adequacy should be. So when we look at what the what the commissioners are recommending, even in terms of a, what they call a basic measure of adequacy, which we really think is a basic measure of subsistence, they're establishing a rate even with hundred dollars a month uh, additional income uh, increase if that were implemented. Their basic measure of adequacy would bring that standard rate up to an amount which is still, for a single person, about $6,000 before below the uh, official uh, poverty line. And for a single person with a child, it's about $8,000 below the official poverty line. So essentially, they're establishing a very slow uh, floor in their standard rate, which it's uncertain how much adding additional benefits through uh, social support or uh, disability benefits, how much that is really going to bring people up to any measure of adequacy. That is still really undetermined. Uh, and we were concerned also when you start to establish rates that are based on standard rates plus supplemental be benefits. Uh, we know very well you can set up targets for when certain governments want to reduce. Rather than reducing the overall rate, they might reduce uh, some of the benefits. We've seen that even in terms of the implementation of the Ontario Child Benefit. You know, first of all, it was accelerated, and then it was decelerated. First of all, it was given in terms of children and family, and then it was at the same time reduced in terms of the basic needs allowance of the parents. So when you start to fragment uh, the income security system in this way, you give politicians a lot of targets and ways in which to reduce. What's happening to the special diet allowance? What's even happening to the, uh, the CSUM uh, benefit, right? You give all kinds of ways in which uh, what look like insignificant changes are making real impacts on people's lives. Unfortunately, when you even look at where the subsistence uh, measure comes from, it actually comes from the Social Planning Council of Winnipeg. Research was done from them by a fellow named Harvey Stevens, former uh, employee of the provincial government. And he does some pretty good research uh, based on what's called the market, basic, uh, market basket measure. Uh, and he uh, essentially based his research on the nature of the, uh, the caseload in Manitoba, showing a lot more people uh, who are chronically out of the labor market for you know, for reasons of disability uh, and other issues as opposed to uh, people who are uh, kind of uh, uh, detached from the labor market and with less uh, less barriers to being able to be part of uh, uh, the labor market. Um, and uh, but Mr. Stevens, uh, when he actually does his research, is quite clear that he's talking about a subsistence measure uh, as opposed uh, for a part of the population as opposed to an adequacy measure. He talks about the basic needs budget covers the cost of food, clothing, and footwear, shelter, personal needs, and household supplies. Uh, excluded from this budget are a range of consumption items that Canadian families normally purchase, like uh, uh, maintenance and the repair of furniture, appliances, home entertainment, sports and recreation equipment, reading materials, postal and communication services. All of these are not included in what he would consider to be uh, a poverty, uh, uh, a social assistance rate based on. Uh, on uh, just the subsistence level of income. It says over the longer term, not having an income sufficient to purchase these other goods and services normally consumed by even low-income families means that individuals and families in social assistance will dip them to their basic needs budget to purchase them from them or do without. In the case of sports and recreation equipment and reading materials for children, the absence of income increases children's risk of social exclusion. A key rationale for including these items in the market basket measure of low income was to measure a standard of living that allowed for participation in broader community activities and social inclusion. And when you look at the low income measure that's promoted in the European Union and the UN, they actually look at a poverty income measure based on the low income, uh, uh, based on the limb, as a, as a measure of inclusion, of getting people enough incomes that they can never figure out and pay for what they need to have all these other things that at least for part of the caseload population under the, under the commissioner's proposal would be uh, denied to people. Uh, we look at what's provided in the current standard rate, it's only at 70% of the uh, poverty line. And if there is going to be something started with a standard rate, and that should be a first step towards adequacy that at least in the, in the first instance brings people up to 80% out of deep poverty the poverty line. And then whatever additional supplements are needed to get people close to the uh, you know, as close as possible to the poverty line uh, for those who are out of the labor market, and still, for those who are working, get them about 10% above the labor market because we have an adequate minimum wage that gives people what they need to make sure they're out of poverty. So we essentially, uh, essentially, I, I'd like to say something later on about what the whole focus on this distance from the labor market is versus the distance from the poverty line is because I think that's a major, the major assumptions included in there that actually are reflected in terms of the adequacy levels that are being recommended uh, in terms of social assistance. 
Uh, so I'm gonna hope I get a chance to say that later, but I know others here, uh, Naomi, for example, and Kyle are going to cover that. And essentially, I think I hope that Trish is gonna talk about a post-austerity uh, 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 economy that actually looks at how to essentially provide security to everybody, whether they're in the labor market or out, and provides the kind of labor market that we need so that everybody can try to participate in society. Thanks, Trish.